I didn't recognize the man staring back at me. He was in pain, confusion, desperation. He was in the mirror. Just a few days into my external suspension, I was disgusted, staring into my own eyes and asking, what are you doing? This was the lowest point of my life at STGIS, and I landed myself there by sneaking out of my boarding house and showing up to a party I knew everyone would be at. I disrespected alcohol, the system, and myself. It was a big mistake, and one that felt impossible to bounce back from, especially when I returned from that one week off campus and I knew that I'd been found out because the men in my house who I stood by and who once stood by me couldn't even look me in the eye, could barely talk to me, and they kept their distance. And I was no better. It didn't matter that my suspension was over. I was still emotionally removed and displaced. None of my cohort or other students on campus looked at me the same way after that party. Reflecting back now, I know that all of the foolishness in that night was because I just wanted to belong somewhere, to mean something and to establish a name for myself in this new place, and I did. But at the cost of trust, respect, and the benefit of the doubt. I walked on eggshells for weeks around everyone because I knew that whatever I had done that night affected them. I felt the weight of this guilt quickly turn into shame. I was shaming myself with the words from family back home and actions and reactions from everyone around me. We've all been there, ashamed. And I know now that I'm not alone in understanding that it is miserable. And in that moment, it felt inescapable. Mary Lamia, PhD, communicates that shame is toxic and crippling, triggered by self or others, and requires perspective in order to overcome. You see, I had to fix this for myself and everyone else. I knew that. But how? So I started by finding the staff who needed to hear what I had to say, and I told them exactly what they already knew. I failed. I made a huge mistake. And that confession and the aftermath that followed it was the beginning of an uphill battle that was the right thing to do. I found another stranger staring back at me, this time in my own room. And I looked him in the eye and I said, you're better than this. Karen Hall, PhD, explains that community is a necessity and it is a natural desire within all of us. Lisa Roundy expands on this idea of a longing to belong and explains that it is an inevitable desire that everyone uses as a means to feel satisfied and fulfilled with a purpose. Other people and the feeling of belonging to a community allows us to develop relationships that fulfill all of our needs. You see, I was forgiven. And that forgiveness gave me perspective of the possibility to bounce back. At this point, people still weren't looking me in the eye. And I was clueless as to what there was I could do to repair this damaged self-image in everyone else's eyes. And I started by giving everything that I could. But in the beginning, all that I could bring myself to give was eye contact. Little did I know that was the best thing I could have done for myself and everyone else. Robert Levine communicates that 
Eye contact can create this sense of inclusion. That inclusion is the same feeling of belonging that Karen Hall, PhD, explained is a necessity to us, like food and shelter. Professor Wesselman and a colleague conducted a social experiment on Purdue University's campus. Professor Wesselman chose strangers on campus at random and observed them. His colleague then proceeded to attempt to make eye contact, exhibiting a smile or no smile, or looking past them as if they were air. And then those strangers were asked after the fact how connected they felt. This social study was designed to evaluate any correlation between eye contact and feelings of connectedness. And what Professor Westman established was remarkable, that every stranger was in an emotional state of disconnect. And until instigated by eye contact, they didn't connect mind and emotion. All of us in here today are in a constant state of emotional disconnect. And strangers agreed that the ones that had felt the eye contact felt more connected than anyone who had been looked at as if they weren't there. A gesture as simple as eye contact can create this necessary connection between mind and emotion. And what I didn't know in the moment was that I was connecting people's minds and emotions and they were doing the same for me. Given my own circumstances, this engagement, it felt new again and it felt like more forgiveness. Now, at this point, you might be asking, how does this connection take place and how do we know that it does? Well, the answer lies within biological processes, and I can refer to my own biology course here on campus. Neurotransmitters, also known as endorphins, are secreted from our pituitary glands in our, in our brain. The most common among these are dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. These can trigger our mental reward system making us more likely to seek out that stimuli, and in this case, the eye contact and what it can do for us more often. Studies out of Purdue University explain that personal interaction can induce these neurotransmitters at a level equivalent to those induced by soft drugs, like alcohol and nicotine. The study goes on to say that over a prolonged amount of time, this, time, this kind of endorphin exposure can create a mild addiction, an addiction to belonging, purpose, and inclusion. Remember when I told myself I had to fix this? And then I asked myself, how? It was in that same moment that I realized I was only in this position because I had been selfish enough to toss aside everyone's sacrifices for me. Every expectation set by myself and others and the opportunity of a lifetime for one person. That stranger in the mirror. The answer was in front of me the entire time. Putting myself first was the issue. Working every day to satisfy my needs was the issue. And neglecting and being careless with everyone else's was the issue. That day, I decided to redefine myself because I felt like I had to for the sake of who I wanted to be. So I stopped focusing on myself and I worked every day so that my actions demonstrated what can I do for you. Now that you have given me a second chance or forgiveness and have provided for me, what can I do for you? And this began as a phase, and then it stuck. And today, it is part of who I am. I enjoy serving others, because at the end of the day, their emotional satisfaction is mine. E.O. Wilson, a Harvard biologist, has defined a new species. One that evolves only so often, but makes leaps and bounds in social progress because they share an altruistic trait. This means that individually, they work at an end goal fit for their community. 
He has defined them as you social. You meaning good, and social meaning society. A good society. And as E.O. Wilson says, they are only a fraction of the world's species. And so is everyone in this room. All of you individually are a fraction of multiple communities. You see, I've learned how to become you social the hard way. Fortunately, it had a ripple effect that hadn't gone unnoticed. And I was surprised and honored at the, at the end of last year to have been awarded on this same stage the Excellence in Care Character Award. I went from bottom of the barrel to unshakable honor in seven months because I stopped trying to satisfy myself and I started working to serve others. Today, I am proud and satisfied with what I see in the mirror. And I know other people are proud of who I've grown to become. So I dare you to take a look in the mirror, engage with that stranger, and ask yourself, am I something worth looking at to my community? Thank you.